Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shaw. I'm the director of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by Governor Janet Mills, Commissioner Jean Lambrew of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services, and Commissioner Heather Johnson of Maine's Department of Economic and Community Development. We're here today to provide everyone an update on COVID-19 across the state of Maine for today, Tuesday, October 6, 2020. I'll begin by providing some of the updates around COVID-19 from an epidemiological perspective and then turn things over to Governor Mills. Right now, across the state of Maine, there are a total of 5,565 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 20 cases since yesterday. Of those, 4,983 are confirmed, an increase of 20 and 582 are probable cases, the same number as it was yesterday. Cumulatively, 457 individuals have been hospitalized, and right now in Maine, seven people are currently in the hospital, one of whom is in the intensive care unit and none of whom is on a ventilator. In the past 30 days alone, 29 people have been hospitalized with COVID-19 across the state. 142 individuals have passed away, the same number as it was yesterday, and a total of 4,838 have recovered, an increase of 31 recoveries since yesterday. Among our cases are 1,076 healthcare workers as well. I'd like to turn next to provide a few updates on some of the outbreaks that Maine CDC is currently investigating. Yesterday, or I'm sorry, this morning, Maine CDC opened an outbreak investigation into the, into the Applebee's restaurant in the Auburn area after detecting a total of three cases among staff members associated with that establishment. There are a number of open outbreak investigations that are currently underway as well. At the Pinnacle Healthcare and Rehabilitation Center, we've identified a total of 16 cases of COVID-19. And at ND Paper in Rumford, a total of 24 cases right now. ND Paper is gearing up for its third round of universal testing, which will occur later this week, right currently planned for Thursday and Friday of this week, after which time we'll have another round of results that our epidemiologists will analyze. Also at the Woodland Pulp Facility in Baileyville, there are a total of 19 cases that have been identified. Seven of those cases are among Maine residents, and 12 of those cases are among residents of other states. Next, a brief update on where things stand with testing across the state. Right now, the seven-day positivity rate across the state of Maine is at 0.58% statewide. Again, for context, the nationwide positivity rate, rate right now is 5%. In terms of testing volume, right now in Maine, we are conducting roughly 437 PCR tests for COVID-19 for every 100,000 people in Maine. To put that number in context, the nationwide average for testing volume is 283 tests per 100,000, and the rate in Maine is 437 tests per 100,000. And finally, a quick update in terms of milestones. Something that we haven't touched on in a little while is PPE. Now, even though I haven't mentioned or provided updates on PPE distribution, it has very much been continuing in the background for the past several months. Indeed, even before the first case of COVID-19 was recorded in Maine. Our public health emergency preparedness team has continued to do yeoman's work, making sure that healthcare facilities, healthcare providers, first responders, nursing facilities across the state of Maine continue to have adequate supplies of PPE. They recently crossed a threshold. They recently delivered their 2.6 millionth piece of PPE. That is to say, the Maine CDC's public health emergency team has now delivered more than 
2.6 million pieces of PPE to healthcare providers across the state. To put that number in perspective, that is two pieces of PPE for every person in Maine on average. That just goes to show that the, the amount of work that has continued to occur to ensure that healthcare providers and facilities have what they need to quickly respond to cases of COVID-19 and keep their patients safe all throughout that process. So I'd like to take a second to thank the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Team with support from the National Guard, the Maine Emergency Management Association, and the Maine Department of Transportation to get to make those PPE deliveries happen and to keep them happening. With that, Governor Mills, I'd like to turn things over to you. Uh, Governor, uh, we're, we're not able to hear you. Um, and so it may it may be one of those things where if you hit your mute button and unmute it again, that might get us back. All right, we will uh, we'll get the governor's audio back online ASAP here. Thank you all for bearing with us. We'll get the governor's audio back up and running in just a moment. While we're, while we're waiting for the governor's audio to come back online, um, I will, uh, I'll share a little bit of some of the work that we've been doing around contact tracing within the main CDC lately. Uh, we continue to have a team of approximately 100 people that are involved in both investigating cases and the contact tracing that follows them. Uh, we try to keep tabs on how we are doing as a contact tracing unit. And so I just will take a moment to provide a little bit of data on where things stand with contact tracing across the state. Our goal is within every single circumstance to try to reach every newly diagnosed do diagnosed person in Maine on the day that they receive their diagnosis from their healthcare provider. We're able to do so in the bulk of time, and we've got some new data on that that we will soon be putting on our website. So please stay tuned for those data. Hi, Governor Mills, we'll turn it back over to you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Governor. Oh, All right, I had to close out and open up again. Technology and I do not always mix well, so thank you for the update. Folks, at the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic, I joined governors across the nation in issuing for Maine a stay at home, stay healthy at home order that required Maine people to stay at home as much as possible to mitigate the spread of this dangerous uh, virus. I tell you, that was one of the most dis difficult decisions I've ever had to make during this pandemic, especially. And, you know, no governor runs for office thinking that one day they'll simply shut the state down and tell their neighbors to stay home and tell businesses to close their doors and families to postpone large gatherings. And like all Maine people, I wanted our state to reopen as quickly as it was safe to do so. I've always said that. And in April, because Maine people did stay home and did adopt health and safety precautions and did protect themselves and their loved ones, the spread of COVID-19 did start to slow down in Maine. While our focus remained on protecting Maine people from this de deadly disease, we could then begin planning to safely reopen parts of our pre-pandemic lives and reopen our economy. Our plan to restart Maine's economy gradually eased restrictions on certain businesses and activities while also implementing protective protocols along with broader health and safety measures to help keep people safe. As of today, Maine has reopened the vast majority of our economy while maintain, ma maintaining one of the lowest rates of COVID-19 transmission. As of October 3, Maine adjusted for population ranks second lowest in the nation in terms of positive cases, fourth lowest in the nation in number of deaths, the lowest in terms of patients ever hospitalized out of the 36 states reporting, 
and the ninth highest in percentage of people who've recovered out of the 45 states uh, reporting. So far, we have balanced public health with economic health. Although it has been pretty difficult and it's been painful for many businesses and individuals. As the winter approaches, we have to continue this important balancing act. And we need now to ensure that the businesses who were able to operate outside safely during the summer months are able to continue operating as the weather gets colder. So today I'm, I've signed an executive order and I'm announcing that beginning next Tuesday, October 13th, Maine will move into stage four of our plan to restart Maine's economy. So beginning October 13th, a week from today, businesses and organizations that serve people through seated activities, seated indoor activities, indoor dining, religious gatherings, movie theaters, for instance, they will be allowed now to operate at 50% of their capacity up to a maximum of 100 people. In deciding to make this adjustment, Heather Johnson, our DECD commissioner, partnered and consulted with the Portland, Lewis and Auburn and Bangor Chambers of Commerce, as well as Visit Portland and Visit Bangor Regional Convention and Visitors Bureaus to establish working groups and teams with their restaurant members and they all evaluated potential solutions for the fall and winter. What we heard repeatedly is that they would all like to open and operate at 50% capacity, no matter how large or small. We have updated the COVID-19 checklist for these businesses and organizations. We've posted them on the DECD website. Appropriate health and safety protocols like enhanced cleaning practices and the requirement to, to maintain six feet of distance between seating areas, all of that remains in full effect. For non-seated indoor activities, such as phys physical activity in gyms, uh, that limit remains at 50 people. The outdoor gathering limit remains at 100, 100 people. Stage four also establishes the reopening date for indoor service for services, service for bars and tasting rooms and distilleries as Monday, November 2nd. So to reopen, those establishments will commit to abiding by the newly posted COVID-19 prevention checklist for seated food and drink services. During the summer months, I also issued an executive order that required certain businesses in Maine's coastal counties and more populous cities to enforce the statewide, the statewide face covering mandate. To accompany the adjustments we're making today for indoor seated service, I'm also expanding that face covering enforcement executive order. That is now required statewide for those businesses. Um, and I also brought the order to, or clarified that the order covers for the mask mandate, covers places like private schools and local government buildings and state government buildings, along with restaurants, lodging and retail establishments uh, in having their employees and clients, customers wear uh, face coverings. We know that face coverings have been proven to significantly reduce the spread of COVID-19. Businesses that violate the order um, are subject to enforcement themselves, including possible fines or loss of license. To date, state officials have issued fines, in one instance, nearly $20,000, and more than two dozen imminent health hazard warnings to organizations that have not abided by the health and safety measures that are meant solely to protect their employees, their customers, their clients, and the general public. We believe that this expanded capacity for indoor dining and indoor uh, seating facilities, along with the continued health and safety precautions, will be a prudent step that balances public health and economic health. And we will continue to evaluate these steps on a regular basis and listen to the feedback of all appropriate industries and see if other adjustments may be made that will support business and still protect the public health. So, while we're making these adjustments today, these measures should not lure any of us into any false sense of security. We have to remember this virus is still very much among us and that wearing a face covering, staying six feet apart, avoiding large gatherings, washing our hands often, all those things are key to keeping Maine open 
and keeping Maine schools and businesses open and keeping Maine healthy. Maine people all worked together this spring, this summer, and early fall to ensure that we could leave our homes safely, get back into some echo of what life used to be. This winter, let's adapt again, keep adapting, and keep staying safe. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the first question of the afternoon goes to Brian Sullivan from WABI. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Uh, Governor Mills, just going through this uh, release uh, about stage four, I guess, if you could, you, you talked about it a little bit, but uh, why is now the time uh, that you think this is uh, the right time to do it? And just that, that balance of, of safety and also the economic part of it as you head into these winter months and that outdoor seating that some of these restaurants had come to really rely on probably goes away. Is that a, a motivating factor with this expansion? That is certainly one of the motivating factors indeed. A lot of these establishments, not just restaurants, but churches have been very, for the most part, very, very compliant in allowing drive-in, drive-up uh, services, outdoor services, um, and outdoor dining, outdoor activities. Um, and the towns and cities have been very, very cooperative in uh, allowing sidewalks and portions of streets to be closed and to be and to allow the businesses adjacent to those streets to use them for uh, for for customer base customer service. So now that's getting harder and harder. Um, and we know, knowing a main winter, um, it's gonna get even harder. So we wanna accommodate that need to serve clients and customers and to, uh, to allow them, to allow these businesses to make money and to allow these institutions to serve their, their customer base uh, and their, their congregations and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, maintain checklists and guidances that keep people apart and safely distanced and uh, the mask requirement, enforce the mask requirement. So it's a balancing, but yes, the, the weather is one of the primary motivating factors. And Dr. Shaw, question for you, and if anybody else wants to chime in, I'm going first. So I guess I'll ask you about um, President Trump and uh, his recent diagnosis. And he tweeted, I think yesterday, he said, don't be afraid of COVID. And uh, they've developed some great drugs uh, for treatment. What's the president uh, getting for treatment that a 74-year-old in Maine isn't getting? And has the treatments advanced to a point where you can be safely released from treatment? I used to try to be treated still, but really released from a hospital four days after being admitted. And just the advancements in treatment, I guess, would be my question. Sure, Brian. Um, you know, I'll, we'll start with the piece on the, the, the drug cocktail that the president received. Um, Two of the three drugs that President Trump received are in widespread use across the country, including in Maine, and both of which, uh, one of which is a newer drug, a drug called remdesivir, uh, that many folks who have tuned in for many months now have, have heard us talk about before. Uh, it's a drug that recently received emergency authorization, and it tamps down on the virus's ability to reproduce within the body. That's a drug that Maine has received from the federal government, and we've distributed to hospitals across the state. The other drug that President Trump received is a steroid, a very powerful steroid called dexamethasone, which tamps down on what can sometimes happen in people with viral illnesses, which is an overreaction by the immune system. Both of those drugs are in wide use across the country, as well as in, in Maine. There's a third drug that the president received on Thursday or, and or Friday, which is an experimental treatment of a cocktail of antibodies that are made in a laboratory that are designed to boost or mimic the body's own antibody response. The president received that under an emergent, a compassionate use authorization. So the data around the total efficacy of that drug are not well known. That's not a drug that has yet received emergency or proper FDA approval. So we don't know to what extent it's being used in Maine, but the former two are widespread and are used in hospitalized patients. Uh, Brian, you asked about the president's discharge. I can't comment on that. That would be something for his physicians. I will note, however, that the president was discharged to the White House, a facility that has robust medical uh, facilities within it. But in terms of the propriety of anything of that nature and his discharge, that's something that his physicians would be able to speak to, not me. Uh, I'm gonna turn to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, 
now that the CDC, this is a question from a listener who is wondering about uh, saying now that the CDC has re-acknowledged the existence of aerosol transmission indoors, is six feet of distance actually enough of a buffer to present to, or to prevent transmission of the virus in public spaces? And again, it brings up that question of if I'm wearing a mask, do I still have to maintain six feet of distance? So Amy, I think the, the CDC itself acknowledged that question in the document that they put back on their website, which is to say that although aerosol transmission is something they acknowledge, it's something that has been uh, has been acknowledged in the scientific community for many months now, it still represents a small fraction of all of the disease transmission of COVID-19 out there. Indeed, if aerosol-based transmission were more widespread, we would see a much different pattern of transmission than the one that we actually do see. We would see something far more akin to measles, which has quite widespread and aggressive transmission. So even though we, the CDC now, quote, officially acknowledges it, it's important to note that scientifically, as well as within main CDC's operations, we've acknowledged it and accounted for it as we were doing case investigations and contact tracing for months now. In terms of whether the six feet margin is sufficient, all the best evidence right now suggests that it is. As with any scientific endeavor, we may learn more about transmission and thus have to adjust. But what we know right now suggests that although there are instances where individuals have been infected at greater than six feet, they do seem to represent the minority. Now the question is how significant is that minority? Based on what we know right now, it remains a minority. If we see greater evidence of longer term transmission, then the six feet might have to be revisited. So the six feet is assuming that you are not wearing a mask? Um, so the bottom line here is that where possible, both wearing a mask as well as maintaining six feet of distance are the optimum. Droplets, are, not, which is the predominant mode of transmission, are not thought to travel much beyond six feet. They are very large and heavy and tend to fall out of the air soon after somebody emits them, whether by coughing or by sneezing. That being said, where possible, the best public health advice is to wear both a mask and maintain six feet of distance. Great, thank you. And my second question is, uh, could you just give an update? I think you started to touch on this last week of how many total outbreak investigations there have been, how many are currently active and how many people that encompasses? Sure, we can, we can provide all those numbers for you, Amy. Um, the number of cumulative outbreaks uh, that we've investigated, uh, it, it tallies well into the several hundreds uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, right now, again, we can get you the list of open outbreaks or at least the number of them and the case counts for each of those. Uh, it does vary greatly day to day, week to week as new outbreaks are detected and then other outbreaks are closed. So that, that list does fluctuate, but we can certainly get you what we've got. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn now to Joe Lawler at the Press Herald. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I have uh, two questions for Governor Mills. Uh, first question is, Trump uh, tweeted this morning, or it might have been last night, about um, the flu being more dangerous than, the, uh, than coronavirus. And, and I know we know that that's incorrect, but beyond that being incorrect, you know, what do you think of him, you know, continuing to, um, you know, say the flu is more dangerous? Sorry, Gov, you're, you're on mute there, Gov. I'm sorry, I said, Joe, I don't think anyone should rely on Donald Trump for their medical advice. Okay, thanks. And uh, my follow-up question is, uh, you know, I know you're allowing uh, uh, bars to reopen as part of this. And, you know, research is showing that, you know, bars are a somewhat risky um, endeavor. So that being the case, does that mean uh, winter high school sports, as long as they, uh, like, you know, basketball, indoor track, et cetera, as long as they ab abide by the gathering size limits, that those are also likely to be green lighted? 
I'm not sure what sports have to do with bars, Joe. I didn't quite follow the sequence there. <laughs> but, you know, sports are, sports, uh, school sports and community sports are regulated by a different guidance. Sure. And, and those, those rules have not changed. Yep, and we we are it's we we are in the fall sports season. We are reviewing what other states have done. What do we know about indoor winter sports right now? We plan to be meeting with the principals association and school boards and the superintendents shortly to begin the process of working on that guidance. We do have again some guidance posted, but we recognize the fact that it needs to be uh, more detailed for winter. So that is in the works. Just to clarify, does that mean it looks like we're going to have winter sports? In the same way that we've approached fall sports, which is we do have fall sports, just in a different way than we've had before, our goal is the same. How do we allow children, students, other people to engage in sports in a safe way? So right now we're working on the same types of protocols that we worked on for the fall, and we hope to do that um, arm in arm with our leaders in uh, the different associations. I'm going to turn now to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. So just back to the timing of this reopening, we are seeing some of our neighboring states like New York, New Hampshire, and New Jersey, they're seeing an increase in the number of cases. We're also having more tourists coming into our state with fall foliage. Again, just going back to the timing, so is now the best time with a lot of these out-of-staters coming and other surrounding neighboring states seeing more COVID cases? Uh, let me take a stab at that first and thank you for the question. I think um, we looked at what other states are doing. We looked at the capacity limits that New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, and Connecticut have for uh, restaurants, bars, fitness centers, and, and, and churches. We think we're failing. We're reasonably consistent with uh, those states. Uh, we are keeping an eye on the progress of other states and, and uh, any outbreaks that result from opening or uh, reopening too quickly different facilities or um, outbreaks can be related to any number of different causes not necessarily to opening a dining area or opening a particular kind of facility but we're watching that very carefully and i think um, let, me add, let me add you you've indicated you've observed correctly that we do see an influx of, influx of tourists at this time of year I myself traveling up and down uh, uh, 95 and the turnpike 295, see a lot of out of state plates. I think that's been fairly consistent though. Um, over the summer, we saw a lot more um, and we're seeing people come here and stay longer, which is a good thing. We welcome them. Uh, and um, uh, I think our guidelines have served their purpose and are continuing to serve the purpose of keeping people healthy, whether they're from Maine or coming to Maine or dining in Maine or going to church in Maine. We'll continue to look at that day by day, week by week. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to Cindy Williams over at News Center. There we go. Hello. Can you hear me now? Go ahead, Cindy. Yep. Um, I, I know we already addressed the school sports question, but I just wanted to say the uh, Portland superintendent um, in the paper this morning said that state and uh, Maine CDC guidance has been a little fuzzy on exactly how far away students need to stay from each other while in school. Is that something you could clear up right now, or um, are the new guidelines that are coming out going to address that more specifically? Uh, fuzzy. So yeah. So we worked very closely with the Department of Education, as well as clinicians, public health advisors, and looked at the American Academy of Pediatrics guidance. And what they say is, for the purposes of school in classroom learning, it may be possible for students to stay three feet apart rather than six feet apart. All that said, that guidance is clear for adults. Children should stay six feet apart for, from adults. Teachers should stay six feet apart from teachers, and when at all possible, maintain that six feet. So that guidance has to date held. We are not intending to change that. All that said, we work day in, day out with our partners in schools, working with, you know, figuring out their spaces, trying to help them implement this guidance in a way that works for their school settings. I'm going to turn next over to Evan Pop at the Main Beacon. 
Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Uh, my first question is for Governor Mills. Uh, Governor, a number of states, including uh, Mississippi and Georgia, have allowed absentee ballots um, to be counted if postmarked by Election Day. Um, so given the reported itch issues with the Postal Service, um, is Maine considering moving our deadline for absentee ballots to postmark by Election Day? Thanks for the question, yeah, Evan. There was a whole day of testimony presented to Justice Stokes just a week and a half ago on that very issue, in good part on that issue, and some other issues relating to elections. Uh, he determined that a person's constitutional right to vote was not at risk by the by virtue of the current statutes, or which included statutes that require that you get your ballot in before 8 p.m., by 8 p.m. on election day. Uh, we've, been, we've been very carefully watching that. Maine is party to a, a case in Pennsylvania, one of two cases nationwide, where a federal judge has actually issued an order to the post office to prohibit delays and to make sure that ballots in particular get um, delivered on time. Uh, Justice Stokes heard all that evidence, and I have no reason to dispute his findings in that area. But we're keeping an eye on things. What we have done is to move up the date when uh, clerks, election clerks can start tabulating the absentee ballots so they don't get overwhelmed in the last week before the election. We've moved up the time when people can vote in person without any excuse or reason um, to up to two days before the two business days before the election. Uh, we've changed some regulations and, and uh, uh, allowed, I think, a safer polling place for people who work at the polls and, and still maintaining the 50 person limit and the six foot distancing um, and all the other health and safety regulations that apply during a pandemic of this sort. Um, so and the other major thing we've done is to work with the Secretary of State and, and the community colleges in designing and having manufactured drop boxes for ballots. Those drop boxes are getting out now into the communities for those who don't already have them, who want them. And so a person, instead of buying postage and going to the post office, dropping off a ballot uh, in, in the envelope signed by the voter, in the post office, they can just drop it off any time of day or night without postage in a drop box under the close supervision, unique scrutiny of the clerk. And those ballots will be secured. They'll be um, emptied routinely by the clerk and one other person, two people at a time. Uh, and uh, I think our regulations along that line, those lines will we'll see that, um, will help us keep the polling places safe and respect the constitutional right to vote. I know that both parties are encouraging people to vote now. Yesterday was the first day of actually absentee balloting. People are sending in ballots in droves and that's a good thing for democracy. Um, so Governor, just to follow up on that, um, I know you mentioned the, the USPS um, part of that and prohibiting those delays on, on ballots. Um, but say for instance, someone mails their ballot on election day and it arrives after that election day deadline. Is it your view that that ballot should be counted or not? If you mail the ballot on election day? Or if it's postmarked the, you know, the day before election day or postmarked on election day and it arrives to the clerk after election day, should that ballot be counted? What the post office is saying is to be safe. Mail your ballot in if you're going to do it by mail and you don't have to. If you're gonna mail a ballot in, an absentee ballot, mail it in a week, at least seven days before the election to be really sure. That's what they're telling us. They also said, they. They also told Justice Stokes that they may not even postmark, there may not be a postmark on an FSD ballot. Sometimes they gather them up and deliver them to the, to the clerk without postmarking. So changing the postmark uh, or, or gauging the effectiveness of a ballot on postmark may be uh, not an effective way to count the ballot. So at least at this time, I think the Secretary of State and I, we discuss this often, we're keeping an eye on things. Uh, and but at this time, I, I'm not inclined to to lift that lift that law. We uh, do want thank to you, Governor. To and as as to as I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Governor. Did you have any, anything more? No, to just add? so we're not inclined to lift the requirement that is fairly old that ballots be delivered be um, by 8 p.m. on election day. Thank you. Um, and just a, a unrelated question for you, Dr. Shah. Um, so since the recent outbreaks among members of the federal government, um, it's become apparent that government officials are considered essential workers and therefore um, subject to different testing and quarantining rules. Um, 
So I was wondering if you could um, say what your recommendation for people who have jobs that require them to travel frequently to hotspots like DC would be. Uh, I think our, our recommendations in this regard apply to anybody who is traveling to any area with higher rates of COVID-19 than we've got in Maine. And that is to say, while you're in that other area, make sure you're staying safe, make sure you're taking steps to limit the amount of exposure that you've got so that when you come back to Maine, you don't bring the virus potentially back with you. Um, I'm going to turn over to Charlie at the BDN. Yes, hi, Dr. Shaw and Governor Mills. Um, I guess this question might be for both of you or, or one of you, I'm not sure. It's um, what convinced you that it would be safe to open bars uh, and restaurants in the beginning of um, November when, when they were the focus of a lot of outbreaks elsewhere in the country? And then um, relatedly, what are the uh, special precautions that they'll have to follow on those checklists? I think my colleague looked on the website, but hasn't been able to find that just yet. If they're not up now, they should certainly be going up by the end of the day today. There are a lot of checklists, and I think we want to give those businesses and establishments time to consider compliance with those um, requirements. There probably are some bars and tasting rooms where it wouldn't be feasible to comply with all the requirements, uh, public safety requirements. I don't know, but we want to give them time to look at that. And uh, uh, the timing is in part, tasting rooms, for instance, many of them were able to serve outdoors. That's no longer feasible or practical um, in the coming weeks and months. So that's one reason we looked at bringing them inside and allowing some fairly strict compliance measures, public safety measures um, to go along with that. And I'll just add that the safety guidance that we'll be posting today is going to be a little different than what we've done before. What we're going to do is try to combine the guidance for restaurants, bars, houses of worship, other places with seated service, meaning that people come in and they sit down in groups separated by six feet in these spaces because those rules are generally applicable. We don't want to create differences or loopholes that other organizations could call through, follow through. But just to give a sense of it, um, we will, in the same way we said this to restaurants, we're going to say this to bars and other organizations. There can't be live singing. We know that singing does project droplets, as Dr. Shaw has previously said, and causes some risk. No woodwind instruments, no open dance floors, and no, no other places where people can congregate standing. As we know, density and duration are the way that we see COVID-19 spread. So, if a bar can operate like a restaurant, like other places that have been operating fairly safely, we welcome the opportunity to give them a chance to reopen. But should we find that there are problems with compliance, that we really can't see the same type of um, precautions working well in these facilities, we'll take action. But we will have that checklist that applies to all seated activity up in the coming days. We'll give these facility, these establishments some time to adjust and implement them while we continue, continue to monitor our public health trends. Because as Dr. Shaw has been reporting, we have seen some areas of concern here in Maine the past couple of weeks. We wanna to continue to make sure that those public health metrics are stable. And we're hoping that again, November 2nd, those types of establishments can reopen the last sector of Maine's economy that has not yet reopened. Okay, and um, just uh, another question about the, the reopening. Um, so I understand that there will be sort of stricter face covering rules as, at the same time as, uh, you know, limits on indoor gatherings are, are kind of lifted. Given that uh, face covering requirements have not been um, easy or widely enforced across the state, I mean, is there any kind of mixed message that that could be sending where um, you're both loosening some rules, but then also ramping up some other rules that have not been, you know, strictly adhered to across the state. I don't think it's a mixed message. I think it's the balancing act that I spoke about earlier. Yes, we're allowing some greater capacity for indoor seated um, facilities, but we're also imposing the enforcement um, requirement on uh, statewide on those businesses who were subject to it before only in the coastal counties and Bangor and Lewiston. So we're 
we're reinvigorating or I should say reinforcing the mask requirement um, at the same time we're allowing certain businesses to ex to expand their uh, CV capacity. Thank you. And the final question for the afternoon goes to Patty White. Thanks very much, Dr. Shah. Um, I have a question about moving to stage four that I think is for you. Can you tell us what benchmarks Maine needs to maintain to stay in stage four? And I know you look at a lot of different metrics, but you know, is there a certain kind of positivity rate or new case rate that you want to see us um, hold or not go above to stay in stage four? Yeah, um, that's, I'm glad you asked that, Patty. It's something that our team has been thinking about discussing a lot internally. Um, I think for, for stage four, what we think about that as, as is as maintaining the gains that we've made so far. Uh, right now, we look at a few things uh, as we're analyzing the data. We look at the daily number of new cases, the geographic distribution of those cases across the state, looking for areas of concentration as well as dispersal. Uh, we look at hospitalizations, certainly the number of people currently hospitalized, and then also, as I reported today, the number of individuals hospitalized in the past 30 days. Uh, and then, of course, positivity rate. We look at not just the aggregate positivity rate, but the number of days where our positivity rate was below a certain threshold, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, that type of thing. And I think it, for stage four, it's really about consolidating, maintaining those gains. If we start to see slippage, in any of those, uh, that will be something that prompts our team from a public health perspective to take a look at. There's not, again, a single formula that we follow where, unlike in the early days where we had very, very clear uh, metrics here, uh, it's more about taking a look to see if on any of those, we see signs that we're regressing, which could be a sign of worse things to come. And in terms of... Um reinforcing the mask requirement was the motivation for that because some of the restrictions are being lifted or was it um, just or is, was it more in response to just wanting to see more people across the state wear masks let me answer if I may initially at least uh, look we we enforce we we adopted that enforcement mechanism for large stores and certain certain facilities in the coastal counties back in June I think it was uh, because we were anticipating an influx of tourists and we wanted to protect the tourist centers in particular, you know, Algonquin, Kennebunk, Port, Bar Harbor, Booth Bay, et cetera, uh, and the larger cities where tourists might be going, Bangor, Lewiston, et cetera. Uh, now it's, we've had, we've had cases in every county, including in recent weeks and months. Uh, the summer tourist season is over. And now we're seeing an influx of tourists, as someone mentioned earlier, uh, leaf peeping season, they don't just stay in the coastal counties or Bangor and Lewiston. They go all through the state of Maine and it's hunting season and whatnot. So people are going, people are coming into the state and going all across the state. So I think it's appropriate to expand that enforcement mechanism to the entire state, to those businesses to whom it applies. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Patty. And Governor, that was the final question of the afternoon. So I'll uh, turn things back over to you. Well, thank you. Let me ask you a question, Dr. Shah, and I didn't think to ask this earlier, but wearing, with the flu season coming on, and I just want to join the chorus here on this call and encourage everyone to get their flu shot, does wearing a face protection or a protective face covering also protect you from the flu? Uh, so, Governor, the answer, the, Governor the, the answer to that is that we think it does, uh, based on some data that we've seen coming out of the Southern Hemisphere. It looks like wearing a face covering has the added benefit of not just reducing uh, COVID-19 transmission, but also other respiratory viruses, chiefly the flu. What we, uh, as, as folks may know, the flu season is flipped. And right now, uh, in, as we're going in to our flu season, the Southern hemisphere is wrapping theirs up. And so we can get a little bit of a sense looking at countries in the Southern hemisphere of not only what may be coming our way, but whether the public health interventions that we've been recommending, whether they have follow-on benefits. And from some data from Australia, as well as some other places, they saw lower rates of flu because of, it's postulated, greater uh, face covering wearing. Yet another reason to make sure that everyone is wearing a face covering. Thanks. I didn't mean to pop that question on you unannounced, but I think it does support the idea of having a statewide enforcement mechanism and state and reinforcing the statewide mask mandate. 
Um, thank you for the answer. Again, get your flu shot, give blood, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you very much.